Be the right club. Be the right club today. Yes! Again, has to be careful of the speed. What a comeback season for Hal Sutton. Right back toward the hole. How about in? That's the second eagle he's made it for this week. <laughs> 17 years later, Hal Sutton is the players' champion. Our next guest on the Be The Right Club Today podcast is Mr. Paul Azinger, 12-time PGA Tour winner, 2008 Ryder Cup captain, um, champion the, the the U.S. team to a victory in 08. Paul Azinger, welcome to the podcast. Hey, I appreciate it. Um, it was hard work, but we got it done. We had some <laughs> we had some technical difficulties getting 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 us all lined up, but we it was a it was a huge victory to get this thing going. So we're we're pumped yeah, up for sure. Yeah, good things happen when things are difficult. You know, persistence pays off for everybody listening out there. Be persistent. So, Paul, tell us what's going on in Paul Azinger's life and your golfing life. Well, I haven't played a lot of golf uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, I kind of was busy with the TV there for a little while, but I think I only have to do one tournament from uh, this date in October until March. So I, I, I'll start up at the Florida Swing unless I'm doing Tigers tournament. I've been on the boat almost every day. I live on the water here in Tampa Bay area and the fishing has been incredible how, and you know what? I'm still, I'm kind of semi isolating, I guess. And I just love it. I'm having a good time. Everybody's healthy. Nobody in my family has COVID yet or has ever gotten it. So we've been real lucky. That's awesome. So where's my invite for fishing? I know any day you get the open <laughs> invite. You got the open invite. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you another thing we're doing here. We just opened this, uh, it's called the Azinger Family Compassion Center, which is a redistribution center. Um, really, was we receive so much overage from uh, Publix and what have you and uh, a variety of different corporations. Uh, we sent out so far 23,000 meals in eight days just in Manatee County in the first eight days of operation. It's called the Azinger Family Compassion Center. We're connected with one more child. It's a uh, about a 10,000 square foot building, and it is just packed full of diapers and canned goods and food. And we're packing backpacks and we're shipping out stuff. And there's nothing in that warehouse today that will be there five days from now but the warehouse will look exactly the same how it's one it's the one thing i think that will last forever and my as my name goes on and you know and we go on and on and on and we win all those tournaments and all that and but we're footnotes this is something that's going to serve a community for a while so that is really the main thing we've been doing other than the relaxing and fishing stuff well that's a a great endeavor and that's something that you've lent your name to and efforts i'm sure and yep. uh, uh the community will benefit from that so uh, you're sure. right about uh, you know doing things that live on past us winning a golf tournament or whatever yeah no doubt about it i mean uh, as the older you get i think you start to see things a little differently quite a bit differently i guess as we mature i've lost a lot of my competitive uh desire um I don't know what happened, but sometimes the light can go out. You know, for Hale Irwin or uh, Langer, that light's never going out. But sometimes that light will flicker a little bit. It flickered in me, and, it, you know, when it flickers and you have a chance to do TV, you go do it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what I did? I mean, this is really off the subject, and we'll get back on the subject. But yesterday, I bought a uh, sporting clay gun. I'm a pretty good shot, so I think I'm going to do some competition in sporting clays, actually. See, isn't that a good idea? Because that keeps you going, man. And uh, I, I, I want to find something I can be competitive in again, I guess. I'm going to play golf today with my college roommate. I, I, it'll be the first time I've played really since the U.S. Open. So it's been a while for me. But, you know, I, I, 
I bet you are a good shot. I bet you're so, a heck of a shot. <laughs> well, so answer this for me. First time you played since the U.S. Open. What are your expectations for today? Well, I know um, you and I could talk about a million things other than golf, but uh, as far as golf is concerned, my expectation is I just want to get loose. I still think I'm going to hit it really nice, to be honest with you. My expectations are reasonably high. Um, I think I'm still physically smart just because I took all that time off. The only question will be timing, maybe, and uh, did I lose any flexibility or anything like that? I can still keep my eye on that ball, and those hands and fingers know how to swat that thing, and I believe I'll still hit the sweet spot. So my expectations are decent. So so give the listeners something to think about. What do you think you can shoot today? If I had to, I can break probably – 75 on a pretty good golf course i'm 61 and you know that's a that's i haven't putted or chipped much you know if if i'm dialed in and i had a money game today i believe i have enough self-belief to think i could make five or six birdies four or five birdies but you know what there might be a couple of big numbers in there a couple <laughs> chunks or something like that i know that's a possibility but that's not what i'm shooting for you know if i'm going to go out there and it's there's going to be something on the line my expectations are high because I have self-belief and I, I'm not sure if self-belief is born to confidence or arrogance or um, if it's earned, but didn't that what y'all, everybody strives for self-belief, how you had it, but you, you went, what age did you get it? You know, that's that to me, what came first confidence or self-belief, how? That's a good question. Are you asking me that right now? Like I, you think I know? I'm asking you. No, I'm asking you because I don't know. I mean, I, I ask it to anybody who's watching or listening. If you're a pilot and you got to land on an aircraft carrier, what comes first? Confidence or self-belief? Self-belief comes first. That's what I think. And then you, once you've done it a few times, you might get confident. <laughs> but you never let your guard down. Uh, so so uh, that's what I love about you. Paul, you're a deep guy. You think deeply. I think that way. I know because if I watch golf and I realize well, got the, the one guy's got the self-confidence and the other guy doesn't, you know, that that's uh, – I'm going to take the guy with self-confidence over the guy uh, or with self-belief over the guy that's just straight up confident. Yeah, well, there's something inside of every human being that uh, exceeds just talent. You know, talent alone will only take you so far, but self-belief, that inner belief in oneself, you're right about that being the – that's the 15th club, to be honest with you. Every risk taker has some self-belief. You know, if you're not going to crack it over that water unless there's a, you believe you can do it, um, then comes, you know, if you're confident you can do it, you get to play at a high level. If, if you just believe you can do it, it doesn't mean you can do it. But it, if you got to believe it. And then if you do it a few times, then you, you get confident. And it begins to snowball for all of us as players. And, man, suddenly you got self-belief on the greens. <laughs> like Cantlay did, it's game over, bud. Once Cantlay got that kind of confidence, that was game over. So, Paul, how would you separate the difference between the two? I would just say self-belief comes first and then confidence comes second. And uh, to me, there's a great, you know, you can fail and fail and fail and still believe without confidence, you know, and that's just a fact. Hey, you knocked on a few windows on the golf course, buddy. Let me tell you what, um, early on, Hal, when me and you butted heads, yeah. you know, I saw you in college. So I had already idolized you and I didn't get really that good until a few years after college. And then I butted heads with you and Curtis in Vegas and in Phoenix and Phoenix first. And I just thought, Oh my God, if I could beat Hal Sutton, I must be pretty good. And, uh, I made putts when I had to, I made some chips when I had to, and it was a big part of the confidence part before the self belief. I mean, the self belief was already there or you don't even give yourself opportunities like that. Do you? I wasn't confident that I could win on Sunday, but once I did, then I was confident I could. And that's what it took, you know, uh, 
it, it, I think confidence is a commodity and you got to earn it. <laughs> it's, I would love to have given Chip back confidence when he was struggling. Yeah, he had to... self-belief to the nines or he would have quit. He had self-belief to the nines, but no confidence. I couldn't sell it so, to him. Paul, you mentioned Vegas. You made about a 40 or 50 footer on the last hole for Eagle. I'm standing out in the fairway watching you do that in front of me. For people that don't know, that was at Las Vegas Country Club. It was a par five over water that we could hit in two. And I watched Paul make this putt from across the green. I hit this unbelievable shot right at the flag about 12 feet behind the hole. I don't know if you remember that or not. I had Eagle to tie you. I hit as good a putt as I could possibly hit, and it didn't go in. And, I remember. Uh, that is just life on the PGA Tour, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and uh, there's a back story to that. I mean, my brain that day, because um, I hadn't won, you know, that was my would have going to be my first win of the year. And uh, so my brain that day on 11, I was on the lead with Curtis. I was playing with Curtis, and you were behind us. And those walls on both sides of the fairways, you know, were out of bounds, and those old Vegas houses. And they were only about knee high, right? They weren't high. You could see right into the yards and into the houses. I told Billy Poor on 12T, I said, buddy, you see those walls over there? He says, yeah. I said, if I hit one over those walls, either one of those walls, it's going to take a bad hop because my ball's not getting off the ground the rest of the day. And I drove it so low. <laughs> I swear, Hal. And I hit every fairway because I went trajectory crazy. I became this, you know, when you – what. Because I obsessed trajectory, it got rid of right and left. Isn't that crazy? So that's visually what happened to me. Then that I'll just say this. <laughs> You're going to hate hearing this part. On 18T, I was getting ready to hit that low seed that sliced around the corner there. And I hit this drive, and I never saw it, Hal. I swear I never saw it. I just told Curtis Strange this the other day. And I looked over at Billy Poor. I said, where'd that go? Uh, Zinger, you hit a high hook over that wall. It went a mile. I hit this pop draw. I, I tried to hit the low cut. That's how nervous I was. I hit a pop hook. So far, how I hit eight iron to that green. Really? Boy, you hit eight a bad iron. eight iron because you had a long putt. <laughs> I, I, it was only about 30 feet. but Oh, uh, was it? It was about 30, but it had to go up that hill on that tier. I remember. You got up top of that little tier there. Yeah. And I had a couple of weird things happen there. One year, I nailed it, one of those domestic ducks on the bank, hitting a one iron to that green. I kind of sculled it, hit that bird, came back into the fairway, and I made birdie. That, I just loved that course, didn't you? That was old-time fun golf. Yeah, you better go low there. I mean, I shot yeah. 67 that day and got past. So, I know. I uh, shot 64. I, got, I shot 64. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> I remember and then you hold that ball at Phoenix out of the – pothole bunker on 16 no i made the putt i didn't hold the bunker shot but i made about a 20 foot or 15 footer um that well, didn't you hold the bunker shot the day before or something on saturday i might have i might have i, I was uh, i was on a just a binge you know i remember my short game went just something happened in my short game and it just took all the pressure off everything else and uh then suddenly you hit it better and that lasted yeah. seven to ten years it really did when my shoulder you know when I got sick with the cancer it was over overnight I didn't realize it was going to end it that fast because I always believed my short game was the man you know and as a result of having that short game I think I just hit it probably a little better with my technique than people thought I mean uh something happened when I came back that the intensity wasn't there as much, maybe, but I don't think my short game was anywhere near what my long – I think my long game got – I don't know, both parts of me got worse, that's all. So, Paul, one of the things we talk about or, or ask a lot of our guests is are, are tour players fragile? And what we mean by that is do you guys fight the same, you know, mental demons or mental uh, – or, or the same nerves and the same doubts as – the regular 10, 15, 20 handicap. What are your thoughts? Well, I don't know if it's exactly the same. I just know that golfers are fragile when you're confident. You think you'll never lose it. And when you lose it, you never think you'll get it back. 
that's just how it goes. I don't see why, uh, you know, anybody's any different. The only, the only common denominator between great players and guys that aren't great is the self-belief is off the chart. You just can't take it away. <laughs> can't take it away from a guy. And I don't know how mu how you can give it to somebody either. You know, I'm not sure if – I don't know. I don't have any self-belief that I could become the computer whiz you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not even going to try. You're not even going to try. That's yeah. true. That's true. Yeah. So, Paul, take us back. You remember this. When we were early years on the tour, none of us knew – whether we were going to be good enough or not. I think that's one of the uh, – I went out there not knowing if I belonged, to be honest with you. And I know you had the same feeling. And and we didn't have that self-belief that maybe we had it or maybe we were on the brink of it. Uh, but we needed to hit some drives along with some of the best players. We needed to hit some equally good irons. And we needed to get mm -hmm. up and down a couple of times where – maybe they didn't think we could get it up and down. And all of a sudden we believed that we belonged. Maybe that is some of the self-belief. We saw us hitting just as good a shots as they did. Do you recall any of that? I, re I recall the first time I ever watched a tour player hit a ball in my life was one of my second year of college. And uh, it was George Burns, believe it or not. It was the first tour oh, really? player I ever saw hit a ball. And the next guy was Ben Crenshaw. And when I watched the ball leave, I'd never looked at their swings as much as watched the ball leave that day. I didn't see it leaving any different than my ball. So that was a big effect on me, positively. But you hit the nail on the head when it comes to going out there and playing the tour and having any sort of confidence whatsoever on whether or not you belonged. I would have never known you felt that way until you just said that. I would have thought you knew you belonged because you had such a great college career. But you're in the same boat. We all are, aren't we? And the, the hardest thing to do is to hit that eight iron when Raymond Floyd's standing there, when mm -hmm. Lanny's standing there. You got to hit that ball when Lanny's standing there, or the Golden Bear himself was standing there, or the Trevino was standing there, or even Arnold. But Arnold was standing there, wasn't he? Yeah. And there was so many guys that would stand there, and they'd fold their arms at you sometimes. Or – you know, admire your action. And I'll tell you what, that was the hardest thing for me was getting over being self-conscious about what they were seeing, like watching Wisecough watch me. Because I could look Wisecough eye to eye, but you got two, you know, radically different motions. And I loved Wisecough. So my thinking was, oh my God, Wisecough's watching me. How am I going to hit a good shot in front of Wisecough? But that takes time, doesn't it? <laughs> it takes a little yeah. time. Or else you got it right away. And uh, it's a huge hurdle for a player to go out there and then suddenly you're, you're trying to compete against guys you've watched. I think it's different today. Don't you think it's different today? I think these kids are going out there with more self-belief than you and I went out there with. They're more ready because it takes them a lot longer to get there, I tell you what. You got to play – you got to qualify, then you got to play that – you know, corn fairy tour. And then you got to get in the top 25 on that. It's hard, man, to get on tour. It's hard. And by then, you know, golf plus we didn't watch golf every day. And when we saw the superstars, it was like, Oh my God, they're the superstars. But it was uh, somewhere uh, Fincham was commissioner when golf went pretty much wall to wall uh, with the golf channel and all that. Now everybody can see everybody. It so right. probably is less intimidating than just seeing somebody like, you know, you see Jackie Gleason every single day. You wouldn't be that intimidated by him. But when you went to the Inverary Classic and saw Jackie Gleason, it was like, wow, that's Jackie Gleason. <laughs> well, to that point right there that you're making, you know, on TV right now, all we see is players making the very best shots. I idolized Jack Nicklaus. And the only time I ever saw Jack Nicklaus hit a shot – was when he hit a miraculous shot. I never saw him hit a bad shot. I didn't even think Jack Nicholas hit a bad shot. And that's, that's what the public sees right now on TV. They never see a bad shot. Well, there's a lot of guys leaving on Friday night. These guys hit bad shots. Yeah, they do. And we did see, you know, gosh, the Jack Nicholas era, if you think about it, 
they'd come on TV and he'd, they'd be on 15 already, 15, 16, 17, 18, sh- broadcast over. Right. Now it's 24 seven. And, and quite frankly, I think we do show bad shots on TV and, uh, you know, Mickelson's in the woods on every friggin' hole. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> it's crazy to watch. He's, he's one of the best of all times, but he doesn't have to hit the fairway. And, uh, Game's changed in that regard. I think the golf ball needs to spin a little bit more, you know. Maybe if you could just say, hey, look, the maximum amount of dimples is this. You get 420 dimples on a ball or whatever, the 416, man, go back to the 384 back when we were hitting it. That ball spun just enough. You know how the, the, the Hall of Fame's full of guys that hit up shooters. You couldn't hit an up shooter now if you tried, I don't think. Yeah. Well, I – no doubt. I, Chase has heard me say this a bunch. I think the first thing they ought to do is make the ball spin more because being able to keep the ball down into the wind over a water hazard was, was really, you had to be knowledgeable to be able to do it. You had to know what you were doing to do it. And, and it put the fear of God even in the people that did know how to do it. That was a tough shot, wasn't it? Yeah, but it's not nearly as hard now. Um, and a lot of times it's less club, you know, it's an eight iron and not a six. Um, it's, it's different now. The ball really, I never was much about, you know, how is it really the ball? Is it really the ball? You know, you got the shafts and the size of the driver. One day someone's going to figure out how to make a 48 inch shaft work like a champ in that driver head. And I think the USJ is doing the right thing by stopping the length of the club. You know, that, that, that would just be altogether different if someone mastered the 48 inch shaft. Um, but the, the ball does need to, it, I don't know that it needs to slow down. It needs to spin more, just spin more. I think the USGA lost sight of the beauty of a, of an up shooter. I remember the first day I hit one, I was so proud that I had made good enough contact to have it leave out of their low and up shoot. Those days are gone. Well, what- one of the easiest clubs in the bag to hit in the old days was a three wood and didn't mind hitting it off the ground either. Now you can't get a three wood in the air off the ground because of the ball won't spin. (laughs) No, it won't. And the harder you swing, the more it'll spin. And and, uh, at the highest level, you know, they would probably hear me say, I, you can't hit an up shooter and, and think, he's crazy. Of course you can hit an up shooter. Well, you can hit it hard enough to spin it. Yeah, maybe you can still have an up shooter once in a while. But uh, those guys, I don't think they realize the difference in that golf ball. And you know what? Golf is just as thrilling and just as much fun with that 384 technology, with that ball that spins a little bit more. It's probably more thrilling and more fun for those players. But um, they think they spin it enough how I, I feel. I don't see a uniform ball. Do you? I, I don't. No. And, I'll tell you what, you could, you know, simple solution, I think, shorten the legal length of the driver, brilliant. Maybe the one other thing that you could do is just go down to that 460 head, not that giant head, or whatever the the one smaller size is. And then the last thing is lower the legal height of the T maybe to three and a half inches instead of four and seven eighths or four and three quarters. Because Bryson's got a five degree driver, and he's he's capable of swinging eight degrees up on a five degree driver. Now, I don't know about you, but I was taught to hit down on my driver or level. I was never taught to hit up. Well, Bryson's five up to eight degrees up. So it's, it's different. So, but he's got with, we had a spinning ball. That's why we could get away with that hitting level or down on it. And all the guys that hit down on it were better iron players too. So yeah, that's right. Well, y'all, y'all have to. Y'all, if y'all hit up on the old stuff, it would it'd go way too high. You'd lose too much distance. Well, the, the ball spun too much. You, we didn't know what to do. You know, we weren't taught that. You know, somehow, who who knows? Maybe we would have been good doing that with that ball, but that's not what we were taught. We were taught golf was meant to be played close to the ground. That's what I was taught anyway. And uh, I just think that physics, math, video technology spin rate being able to measure that stuff turned golf into something more like a nasa experiment 
what can we mathematically figure out to get everything to function as great as possible? And it was inevitable that they would outperform the USGA. Every company, you know, there's so much R and D money going into that. There's no way the USGA is going to keep up with that. And I had someone at the USGA tell me one time that the ball's always been allowed to go this far, but that the manufacturer figured out how to make it spin. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But the the manufacturers just it's simple math now. They launch at twelve with you know two thousand RPMs of spin and a club head speed of one twenty, it's going X. That's why I know that if how how about this? If you had a golf ball that had no dimples on it, well then it was just it'd be a knuckleball. If you had a golf ball with four hundred and twenty dimples on it, it'd be whatever it is today. And <laughs> but you could go from no dimples to the maximum dimples. There's got to be a place in between there on that scale. That's optimum. Is that how many like dimples a, are on a golf ball now? 420? I think it's 416, but please don't quote me on that. I, I honestly God, I have no clue. That's somebody told me that the other day. I'm only going by what they told me. So <laughs> I'm just throwing those numbers out, but I just know that there's a spin rate from somewhere to, from zero to what it's doing today. Or, you know, we've seen balls go half distance, you know, driving range, make a ball go half distance. We've yeah. seen that or three quarters distance. So they already know how to make it spin and go shorter. There's something between that and what we've got today that ought to be just a perfect fit. Well, it may be so far gone right now, you know, uh, I mean, chase hits it about three fifty, So, uh, you know, he's, he's on that camp that uh, loves to see the ball go a long ways. And, and uh, I think, you know, I, I got him in here. I got him in here and got him to hit one of my drivers, the last wooden driver that I played with. And he damn near missed the whole face with it. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. And you, ne and you never missed the sweet spot. That sweet spot for Hal Chase was as big as the end of my finger. <laughs> it was small, That's not true. Yes, it is. Hey, oh, if you no. missed it, it was a little high or a little low, but it was never right or left of it. Well, I, well I you think, know, you brought up – go ahead, Chase. I was just going to say, I think one of the biggest differences in the equipment is just the weight. I mean, those wooden drivers were so heavy. Steel shafts were so heavy. That was the thing. I mean, I grew up with them. I played persimmon. Um, but the other shot that I, I think personally is missing is the is the, the low spinning wedge shot. Like, that was fun. You know, hitting a 50-yard wedge shot that you could spin back 10 or 15 feet. Like, that was cool, and we talk about all the time, like, the 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 third shot to 15 at Augusta. Like, that that shot's scary today, but it was real scary back in you guys' day because you could spin a wedge so far and, and, and had to really be careful about that shot. So, that from a from a spinning standpoint, that's, I miss the, the old Bellottas or the, the, pro, the professionals or the prestiges that you could, you could one hop and spin it back 10 or 15 feet on a 40 or 50-yard wedge shot. Now those things launch straight up in the air and don't spin at all. I think that uh, today you cannot hit a variety of shots with your wedges like that. You know, there's sort of, there's kind of just, I don't know. I felt like I didn't back up those wedges with the 384. And it almost commanded a certain technique to hit it one hop stop. How had it one hop stop? But how had to be careful. Because if Hal got in there too deep, it'd back up too like far. crazy on him. Yeah. And it'd back up too much. But yep. you figured out how to control that. You ain't got to worry about that now. Not like you did. Not like you, not like you did. So what do you say to the to the 10 or 15, 20? I mean, the, the overall scores for everybody else outside of tour play is not, not improving. It hasn't improved that much from the, the, the new equipment versus the old equipment. So is it two sets of rules? Like, do we – I mean, the problem with two sets of rules is you, you, you play in college with one set and then you have to go change your whole life to play on play professionally. Like, what, what's, what's the answer? Where, where do we go? I'm not sure that's the answer, although baseball has the uh, aluminum bat in college to the big league bat. You know, that's one big difference. I don't know if you need two sets of rules. I think the game's pretty – you know, it's doing pretty well. I, I don't know how you ever go backwards. You either have to dead stop it, though. If you know the the, if you ask somebody 
if they're going to have more fun hitting it shorter, it's going to be a hundred percent. No. So if the USGA thinks they're going to win that argument, I think they're barking up the wrong tree. I don't know that you ever sell that, that you can't still fly at 350 with a ball that spins more. I just think there's just a little more risk and uh, it's just a lot more fun because you might have to do something a little different to hit it 350 into the wind than to hit it 350 in a crosswind, you know? What about limits? I, I, I'm not sure if I'm making a good point or not, but the, I would like to see the ball spin more. But, however, I think the game right now, it's, it's just hard to justify going backwards. What about limits in, limits in loft on driver, like saying you have to have at least seven degrees or eight degrees? I mean, because all the long drive guys you see hitting it, like Berkshire has a four-degree driver. I mean, if – if you put – right now, at Bryson's speed, if you put Bryson at an eight-degree driver, I mean, he can open the face a little bit to lower it, but you're still so – he's still so limited. You mentioned – what he was saying is what if they limited – in other words, it had to be seven degrees or more of loft on a driver instead of having four or five degrees. Uh, no, man, I, I think, uh, you know, that's something you could do. But the way we played, I mean – my driver said nine degrees on it at the bottom, but it was really 11. So I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know. I think if a guy can hit a one degree driver, he should go ahead and try. I wouldn't change yeah. that. Simple as possible, Hal. If you're going to really well, you think, mentioned, I got to fix this. Well, you mentioned something okay. earlier that I want to go back to. You talked about how when you won Las Vegas, you told, you said you didn't want to hit it. If it went over, out of bounds you wanted it to bounce out of bounds you wanted to play yeah. close to the ground that's the yeah. way you were taught so i worked quite a bit with byron nelson before i ever turned pro and he used to tell me how when you get nervous get on top of the ball and try to drive it in the ground right in front of you which is what you were trying to do you know you don't see yeah. anybody doing that in the game right now uh, it's the greatest difference in the game now i believe the go-to shot is straight up in the air for almost every single player. You get a smaller stature guy like a Kisner or Cantlay or somebody, it might be different. But for the most part, Dustin Johnson, Justin Thomas, uh, Bryson, they, Rom, his go-to, Rom's go-to is probably a lower cut. He's one of the few, but everybody, I think their go-to is straight up in the air, Hal. That's a massive difference. <laughs> JT hit that hit, hits that little low bullet at times. He hit a couple at the Ryder Cup. Was it at the was it the players? He hit a low little draw off eighteen. He's got the most incredible draw three wood in his arsenal of shots. It's really something to behold. And in error, when we say that ball doesn't curve, he'll make it curve, won't he? And um, that's it. Was he's a good player? I'll tell you that. Uh, he's he's one of those guys. I think he's got a couple of go tos. But he's not afraid to throw it straight up in the air. So, Paul, you mentioned your short game earlier as being one of your strengths. Why? Why do you think that was? What did you do with your technique that that made you such a so good around the greens? I actually just asked a lot of guys, and I had some ability to imitate what I saw them do. For example, like an Andy Bean with that stiff arm technique, and I could mimic him in my mind. And once I got once I learned how to evaluate a lie, then I started to think like, can I possibly whiff this and have it go straight down? And 99.9% .9 of the time, the answer is no. So I try to whiff it. And I have this idea in my head that it's always going to go forward. I, I'd have to have you right there with me. But in my mind, if I know if I can cut the legs out, I've got a lot of confidence I'll get the speed in the right spot. And that's probably more critical on a little pitch than anywhere else. Uh, and then sometimes the speed has to feel like gravity on the way down, which is really hard to do. But I could imitate Crenshaw's technique. I could imitate uh, Bean's technique really well. And I felt like uh, there was one other guy. Trevino really talked to me a lot about short game. And he helped me with my grip and, you know, and how to keep the club a certain way through the hitting area. And probably the all-time capper, though, was Phil Rogers himself, the great Phil Rogers. When he really got me to understand bounce and how the shaft, where the shaft needed to be, it gave me a lot of confidence. 
And then I had this ability to imitate, you know, so that was helpful. Um, but I was one of those guys, I was always just like, I'll take any advice, you know, and then kick stuff out that I didn't like. I talked to Rom about short game. He, he approached me in Phoenix this year. And uh, he says to me this, he says, uh, so I understand you can chip the ball uh, off the Bermuda into the grain and uh, not make it, it. Is this true? <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I said uh, yeah, I can do that. He says, can you teach me? I said, well, I'll try. So months, you know, go by, we get on the Florida swing and he sees me and come show me how you hit that shot. So I get over there. Adam Hayes is caddying for him. Adam said it was life changing for him, but I didn't feel that way. I felt like this guy made me answer his questions. It'd be like, um, it, sorry, it'd be like going to uh, see Ted Williams to get a fly casting lesson. He's never going to give you the answer. He's going to make you ask the question. Well, so I'm trying to. I say, look, here's what I do: this, 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 and this. And he says, "How come uh, you tell me?" what it is, the reason you want to get the shaft like that. And I said, well, because, uh, you know, this is where it's got to be if you want the bounce to work. And I would explain it to him, but he was very inquisitive. Interestingly, that that day, dang, that's Tony. That's my wife calling me right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> later that day, or a cow comes over to me. But he was like a lost little kid, Hal. He was like, I don't know what to do. And I watched him for a minute and it was completely different because Ron was already locked in. He didn't need Jack. All I did was confirm what he was doing. Morikawa was different. I looked at Morikawa and I was like, man, his weight's left. He reverses out trying to get it up in the air. So I said, look, let me show you this. And I clipped, clipped, clipped about five in a row. No divot. So I said, here's what you got to do. And I did that. And he was just like taking it all in, taking it all in, absorbing like I was. When I was playing, when I was young, Rom, it's completely different. Prove it to me. Morikawa <laughs> was like, Morikawa was like. So I knew right then Rom and Morikawa were different cats, for one. And I thought, you know, you could tell he was unbelievable. So anyway, Morikawa, 10 minutes in, um, he was clipping gems. Clipping gems. And I was like, man, this dude's got it already. He's good. Uh, he won the tournament that week and then he thanked me for the chipping lesson. So that was kind of cool, but what a difference in personality types though. And it just shows you, man, it's all kinds of personality types that can win on tour. So Paul, give us, give our listeners at home a quick chipping lesson off tight lies, soft pitches off tight lies. Cause we see yippy stuff all the time in the Academy on those shots. Get off your left leg, get off your forward leg. Let's say you're right-handed, just get off your left leg put your feet really close together where your heels are touching. If they're not touching, you should barely, you can, should be able to put a knife down there maybe, but that's about it. And, uh, get your weight on your right legs, at least 60, 40, right. And move the ball back there, right there by your right foot and just make a nice straight line with the shaft in your right leg and get that ball back there. Maybe just a hair in front of your right foot, your back foot. You got 60% of your weight, maybe 80% of your weight right for starters. And all you do is return that shaft right where your leg is, right there to 90. That's all you do. But if your weight's on your left side and you want to pitch the ball in the air a smidge, you're in deep trouble. Here's the deal. The leading edge is fatal when you want to pitch it in the air. The back of the club is the key to success. So how do you engage the back of the club? You move your weight back with it. Move your weight back first and then just stay steady there. Don't, you don't, don't fluctuate. Once you get the shaft to 90, you, you can naturally move through it a little bit, but you got to get the shaft to 90 at the bottom. And it, the best way to do that is to practice getting it back on your right foot, line up your right leg, your right foot, and your shaft. Your right leg, your shaft, and the ball. That's the key. Line up the ball, your leg, and the shaft, and then just return there. The bounce will hit the bottom of the club. And in your brain, think, I'm going to cut the legs out. The bounce is gold. Okay. The leading edge is fatal. It's interesting because, you know, most everybody's teaching forward, like wait, way, 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 way forward, lean the shaft more forward. I feel like everybody's kind of teaching how to hit punch shots. 
versus- yeah, that's a chip. I mean, that to me, I define a chip and a pitch two different ways. A chip to me is when the ball gets in front of the face. Everybody can do that pretty well. Um, but a pitch is when you're kind of the club head actually goes right on by the ball and then the ball comes up. So that's a pitch to me. That's how I define it. I don't define it by yardage. I define it by the club head and the ball reaction. Well, there you, you have it, listeners. One of the greatest of all time with a pitch, Paul Lazinger. So, Paul, you did a video. You did a, you did a video about toe versus heel on uh, YouTube. I saw. Talk a little bit about the difference. Why we want to use the toe versus the heel? Well, the heel digs and the toe cuts. That's a great Jackie, uh, not Jackie Burke, but uh, uh, what's the name down there in Key Largo? Your man, Ballard, Jimmy Ballard. Ballard, yeah. The heel digs, the toe cuts, and that's a fact. That I think that really relates to full shots in his mind, but in, for me, it always related to pitch shots. My brother asked me one time, well, do you just try to hit the ball on the toe of the club? I said, no, I try to get the toe of the club down on the ground and the heel ever so slightly off. You, you can change your lie angle. You can make it a little bit flatter, which is helpful. But I like my hands close to me, and I, I like my hands up high, like I was showing you on that, you know, or just saying you get your right leg, the ball, your right leg, and the shaft lined up. Now, if you can get your hands high and the toe down and then just make your straight arm motion and get that shaft to return to 90, it, it's it's just gold. And I believe that the toe side of center is much more predictable. It just seems like it just seems like, and I know that there's also a little more bounce on the uh, toe side of the golf club and for the most part. Um, you don't see great players cutting the bounce off the toes of those clubs. They're always taking the bounce out of the heels because the heel, man, that's death. You don't want the heel touching. You want center to toe side of center on those little clips and pitches. I teach that big time. High hands, too. I'd love to come over there one day, Hal, and just hang with a bunch of your uh, – players i know you got a lot going on over there and uh, well, just do some game stuff that's one thing i can still do with my body is still clip it off the ground <laughs> well we'd love to have you here anytime paul it's been a, a pleasure having you on you taking the time we love hearing you on tv paul and i for all the listeners out there we've been great friends for a long time uh you know i'll tell a quick story about paul before we close here uh I went to Centenary College, and Floyd Horgan was a coach there. And Floyd took a guy named Frankie Howington over Paul Lazinger, and I couldn't believe it. And I know Paul has an opinion on this as well, but we'd have been a much better golf team if Paul Lazinger had been on our team. Well, probably. I think uh, but Frankie Howington was a gamer. You remember that guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> he was. Uh, so he yeah. was high on self belief. Trust me. Yes, he was. That was one high <laughs> self belief guy. Yes, he was. It yeah. got him to you know, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I'd have gone to Centenary and been been a college teammate or roommate or something with you because you were unbelievable in college. And I remember the first time I saw you at Sun Tree uh, down there. You remember playing at Sun Tree? I do remember playing there. Down there uh, in Titusville area, south of Titusville, Coco. Yeah. Gosh, what a hard course. And you shot the lights out. And I believe you won that tournament. And I was like, man, that Hal Sutton can play, buddy. Uh, so well, we always had Hal Sutton stories when I was at junior college at Brevard. And well, one of the, one of the things that, that I recall, and this was true of you too, because you played the ball close to the ground. There were certain guys that when the wind blew, they were licking their chops. And you yeah, and I happen right. to be one of those guys. And there were other guys that when the wind blew, they wanted they got up and saw the wind blow and they wanted to go to bed because they played the ball so high in the air. And, and you know, the wind was a, a difference maker for a lot of people. So, you know, we had a ball that spun, you know, and you and I kind of knew how to handle. You called it an up shooter, you know. We kind of knew how to handle those shots. Yeah, it's different in that regard. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I always felt like when the wind blew, it was like throwing a rabbit in a briar patch. And I remember your caddy, Freddie, he'd see me on the driving range when the wind blew. He's like, oh, man, Zinger, watch out. Because he knew. He knew me and you both were going to have a good day. And generally, we did. And, uh, yeah, you could check guys right off the list when the wind blew. I remember hitting balls by 
uh, Trevino at Colonial one year, and there was a guy I had already bonded with Trevino pretty well, and uh, we're on the very back of the range back there, and there's a guy to my left hitting, I don't even remember his name, hitting these high moon shots, and uh, Trevino looked at me and said, that boy got no chance, and he was gone. <laughs> but you know what, Al? That's like the only game in town now. Yeah, I know. I know. Great. I, you and I might not even exist in a, as a young man if we kept the same attitude of trying to play so close to the ground. Yeah, I changed. You know, my swing changed. My knees drove more. I didn't have the ability to eliminate the left side as much. You know, it was all on a quest to gain a, enough of a trajectory that, you know, was going to make me be able to play. And you and I both know what was going on with the field staff. And, I mean, sometimes – I mean, we had a stretch there where the greens were like concrete every week, and it was like, man, <laughs> well, I hope they come to one of my courses one of these tournaments, you know, where the greens hold a little bit. <laughs> you remember that patch? It was tough. And uh, yeah. Yeah. it was tough patch. I mean, I remember being on that player advisory council talking about course setup, and it makes a difference to a guy's career. If you get a course that's rock, you know, courses that rock hard all year, Low ball hitter, he got no chance. Well, I remember I was on the uh, policy board when Tiger came out there, and it seemed like the golf course has gotten longer, the greens were harder, watered in front of the green. Uh, you remember those days, don't you? Yep, I do. I, I mean, like I, I remember telling Fincham, I said, you don't realize how good this guy is. I said, he will win no matter how you set it up because he is that good of a competitor. And – uh Anyway, long story short, hey, you've been great. Thanks for being on. And uh, tell Tony I said hi. Uh, I miss it. you, Paul. Uh, you too, Hal. I'll, I'll see you soon. You're looking good. At least uh, you're looking good here. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Paul. All right. See you guys. See you, Chase. Be the right club today. Yes!